Our next speakers are Simon Darcy and Tracy Dixon. Simon is a professor, professor of social inclusion in the University of Technology, Sydney, Australia. Over his career, he has researched, contributed policy development and advocated for improved access and inclusion in the natural environment. Tracy is an associate professor of event and tourism management at the University of Canberra in Australia. His research has focused on minimizing the physical risks of being outdoors while maximizing the health and well-being benefits. Simon is presenting first through a pre-recorded talk, and then we'll welcome Tracy. Welcome, Simon and Tracy. Hi, my name's Simon Darcy. I'm a professor of social inclusion at the UTS Business School, University of Technology, Sydney, and am the co-investigator with uh, Tracy Dixon, who's doing the main presentation. I've got 90 seconds. The Australian context around environmental planning and natural areas is one that goes back to our Australian constitution, where the environment really wasn't thought about much at the uh, beginning of the um, 19, uh, beginning of the 20th century. So the, the whole constitution in itself leaves the environment out. So the environment in Australia is dealt with largely uh, under state, which is similar to your provinces, and hence can be a little different moving from state to state. However, we have had a Disability Discrimination Act since 1992, and I congratulate the Canadian government on moving forward on this very important area in Canada. In Australia, we, uh, sorry, under the um, Disability Discrimination Act and the New South Wales uh, implementation of it. I was part of the Disability Council of New South Wales when we uh, brought in what was called the Inclusion Act 2014. And this placed on the agenda the importance of disability inclusion action plans by all levels of government uh, and, and the way that they are implemented. It took it from being um, left out, omitted or othered by various uh, groups to making it a required inclusion that had to go beyond uh, just being uh, a compliance base. Uh, hence, uh, best practice in this space, and we believe we're part of that best practice, is developing co-design processes so that there is true and authentic consultation that sometimes brings with it an uncomfortable truth for the organisations involved. I would suggest that most natural resource-based parks organisations have a clash of cultures uh, between uh, resource management and a new developing culture around social sciences and the uh, engagement of uh, all stakeholder groups that are involved. So uh, this is why it's important. It's on the agenda. And it's far, more, uh, it's far more important now to make sure that any investment in this area is appropriate, effective, and efficient from a public policy perspective. I will now hand over to Tracy Dixon to present uh, the rest of the story uh, from a theoretical and an empirical perspective. Thank you. I do note that I forgot to uh, say why the background photo was so important. These are beach environments. Uh, this beach environment, while in the metropolitan uh, area of Sydney, extends into a marine reserve. Uh, and that marine reserve uh, is used by um, an organisation called the Sargood Foundation for undertaking a variety of um, engagements by people with high level disability uh, and spinal cord injury, similar to myself, uh, who I, I didn't identify as a person with a disability uh, in the earlier part of the recording. So this space and place are being tested for the boundaries of what had been considered uh, activities appropriate for people with high level disability. So within this precinct, we are seeing everything from getting back into the ocean pool to doing um, snorkeling, 
and scuba diving licenses through to the ultimate engagement in the water of getting people back surfing uh, in the adaptive surfing movement. Thank you again. Hi, my name's Simon Darcy. Thank you for the opportunity to present on this uh, policy development that uh, Simon and I were involved in. You'll note that Simon can't work out what 90 seconds is. As we start, Simon and I wish to acknowledge the Monero Narigo and the Gadigal people who are the traditional custodians of the land upon which we live and upon whose shoulders we stand. And to all First Nations of the lands who, of those who are listening to this presentation, we acknowledge their and your continuing connection to land, skies and water, and we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Next slide, please. Building upon Simon's comment, comments, federally in Australia, the disability action plans have been required since 1992, while in the state that we live in, New South Wales, public authorities have been required to have a disability inclusion action plan since 2015. Next slide, please. And next slide. Previously, I was a member and chair of the New South Wales Minister's Advisory Council for one public authority. In 2017, we were asked to provide some input as they began to develop their disability and inclusion action plan. As the presentation started, it was clear that the work had been, that we had done years ago on the Alpine Accessible Tourism Project in partnership with Disabled Winter Sport Australia, nearly a decade earlier, may be of help, and so it was. This aim of the uh, Alpine Accessible Tourism Project was to develop summer accessible tourism opportunities in and around Australian alpine areas, yes, we do have some, that leverage off the good work done by DWA in partnership with the resorts for nearly three decades. Next slide, please. During my six years on council, I kept prompting about accessibility in all protected area plans, and Lucy will be pleased to know that included toilets. In March 2021, I was approached about a consultation process on a draft accessibility policy. With Simon, we devised a great two-day residential conference at Sargood, only COVID wanted to be invited too. And so we moved to online. While it was incredibly challenging for all, just as the, is happening here, it also had benefits. Next slide, please. In consultation with the staff, we defined four key objectives for the workshops. Inform policy, develop relationships, build internal capacity, and consider how to keep the conversation going. Next slide, please. Representation was invited from across five dimensions of access from advocacy groups, disability service providers, disability activity groups, access consultants, and carer groups. Simon and I were very clear that it was essential for the internal stakeholders to be listeners and to avoid trying to defend what may have occurred before. Next slide, thanks. The guiding principles for the workshop were evidence-based, solution-focused and co-creation. It was no good if all we did was to tell the organisation what was wrong, if we weren't able to provide evidence-based solutions. And over the last couple of days, there have been many uh, comments made around the solutions. To help everyone have a similar theoretical understanding, we briefly presented five key theories or, or concepts that I'll touch on now. Next slide, please. The first was the socio-ecological framework. It's a reminder of the different layers where change may need to occur and or where change has already occurred that may leverage more change. So at the macro level, you've got the society as a whole, the political economy, the social, the technological. The meso is the parts of society, so community groups, organisations, and then the macro in the middle is the actions of individuals, including support network for people with disabilities, such as adaptive sports organisations. Next slide, please. The second model we drew upon was from Pine and Gilmore's 1999 Harvard Business Review article on the experience economy. And we've heard various comments over the last couple of days about the visitor's experience. They suggested we have moved from a commodities economy to goods, then services, and now an experience economy. In 2012, Simon and I had taken their model and added a dimension of access 
that related to how independent the traveller may be, resulting in three continuums of active versus passive, absorption to immersion, and independence to dependence. And the question is, who visits national parks and why? And there have been, again, various comments about why people uh, visit national parks. Next slide, please. We drew upon Simon and Buhalis's conceptualization of accessible tourism, particularly independence, equity, and dignity. We also drew upon work by Simon and I around the idea of the whole of life participation and all those groups that would benefit from accessibility. And that was touched on in the pa panel just previously, where you know, looking at people from you know, uh, birth to senior citizenship. We noted the difference between accessibility and inclusion, but acknowledged that the latter would need to be addressed later on. So the focus of the workshops was purely on accessibility, not on inclusion. That was to be a, a, a later uh, activity. Next slide, please. The fourth related to the matrix with five dimensions, mobility, vision, learning, cognitive and mental health, and five senses, hearing, smell, taste, touch and vision. This highlights the complexity of the lived and embodied experiences of people with access needs, that remembering that many may have hidden access needs. With infinite con combinations, it is difficult to have specific products, services or experiences that would meet all these needs. And again, over the last few days, we've heard about the importance of information so people can make a decision upon their own needs. Next slide, please. Another idea was around the travel chain, travel chain and service touch points. And it asked you to consider who is the person traveling and then how is accessibility addressed across their journey, such as why are they traveling, their planning process, how easy it is to book their travel, how they travel to the destination, then multi-sensory experiences at the destination. At each stage of the chain, there is a service touch point and probably many partners in providing their journey. And we encourage them to think about who their partners were along the way, both on and off park. Next slide, please. After the first workshop, participants were tasked with consulting with their own stakeholders about the good, the bad, and the ugly experiences of accessing protected areas. Simon and I coded them into themes. What was interesting was that the stakeholders identified gaps across the whole of the travel chain, including societal attitudes, suitable pre-travel information, quality accessible experiences, trail designs, trailhead access, and the unintended consequences from repair, maintenance and redevelopment. It was particularly important in this process for internal stakeholders to sit and listen and not to defend. Next slide, please. Next, we move from problems to possible solutions. Key solutions provided by our participants to overcome the barriers they had previously identified may be summarised under two categories, providing accurate information and consultation. Another way of putting it is effective two-way communication. Next slide, please. In the final workshop, we return to the focus back to the policy development and implementation. This including showing this temporal extension of the socio-ecological uh, framework or the TESF. Basically what we're suggesting is to think of when and how change occurs across each layer of the socio-ecological framework when you're planning for change from the intra and interpersonal, organisational, community and public policy. Effective change doesn't always happen at once. It's staggered and often messy. Next slide, please. As you will be aware, there are many terms that may be used in the accessibility and disability space, some of which move in and out of fashion. Rather than telling them specific def definitions, we generated a list that needed to be defined for this organisation, for this policy at this time. This list may change in the future. Next slide, please. Then in terms of embedding accessibility into the organisational policies, processes and culture, we suggested that accessibility should not be siloed off into some department or organisational unit. It should be everyone's responsibility. Accessibility should be business as usual for all. Next slide, please. The final aspect was to provide some steps for moving forward. A policy is only good as its implementation. 
As Simon reminded us at the beginning, policy needs to be appropriate, effective and efficient. We don't want to be constrained by the limits of the experience and imaginations of those writing policies. We want to provide the best information so that all can achieve our own dreams and reap the benefits of being in our protected and natural areas. areas. Then for those people here who lead small, micro, charitable and not-for-profits, I would encourage you to have a succession plan so that your vision continues beyond your involvement and leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. That was fantastic to hear about the research happening in Australia at the moment. Unfortunately, I don't think we have time for questions, but we'll gather up the questions that we did get and we'll send them over to you and Simon to respond to later. That'd be wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much.